What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there's lots of exciting news to go over here this week. But before I get into the news stories, I first want to give a huge thank you to Petrobox for sponsoring this week's update. So Petrobox is a monthly car culture subscription box and they sent me last month's box and it was full of a bunch of cool stuff here, including a waterless wash spray, a really nice 420 GSM microfiber towel, a screwdriver, a magnet that actually has a subscriber's car on it. There's an air freshener, a $15 eBay Motors coupon, a Too Fast, Too Furious inspired little Skyline pin, a cool little charger sticker like the one from the Fast and the Furious, uh, a cool shirt that says Drive More on the back, and even a beef stick. Plus, you can win some rotiform monoblock wheels if your box contains the golden ticket, which is pretty exciting. Each month's box contains different things, and there's two tiers, a smaller basic one that gives you two to three items, and this premium one that gives you five to seven items. You just choose whether you're into domestic, European, or Asian cars, or everything, along with providing your shirt and glove size, and then you just wait and see what each month's surprises are. So head over to MyPetrolBox.com and subscribe now. When you do, be sure to use promo code MattMoran for $10 off your first box as well. But getting into the car news this week here, first off, Honda has finally given us all the specs here, at least some of the specs for the 2023 Civic Type R. And so, um, you know, it's launching this fall. We'll have more details later on in the fall. We still don't know pricing, unfortunately. But what we do know here is that uh, it's going to have 315 horsepower and 310 pound-feet of torque from this revised 2-liter turbo four-cylinder. So there was a leak earlier this week saying it was going to be like 330 horsepower or something. Unfortunately, 315 is what we ended up with. So it's nine more horsepower, 15 more pound-feet of torque than before. Uh, the extra power comes from a redesigned turbo, intake, and exhaust. Um, and that exhaust, by the way, has an active valve that opens at higher RPM to give it a little bit of a throatier sound. The power increase is a little underwhelming, but you know you have to look at the context of where the automotive industry is at right now. You know the main competitors are the Golf R, um, and I guess you could kind of say the Elantra N, uh, and then the uh, GR Corolla. You know, but I mean, really, you know, aside from the Elantra N, it's the only front-wheel drive thing, and that's not even offered in a hatch because the Veloster N's gone now. Um, you know, the Debra STI has gone away, and so you know the top competitor is the Golf R with 315 horsepower. This matches that at 315. Honestly, they have no incentive to do anything more unless they want to just wow people with, you know, a ton of power. But, you know, I mean, the incremental stuff is, you know, what a lot of the Japanese brands have done for a long time. So I'm personally not too shocked. And I was kind of, you know, saying in previous updates, like, don't expect too much. It'll probably just be a small little enhancement. And sure enough, that's what it turned out to be here. But at least this is sticking around, unlike the Veloster and again, and, you know, the STI and stuff. So gotta you know just be thankful i guess for what we still do have and it still is going to be very important you know potent as far as the power goes i mean you know the previous type r was no slouch and this should be even more impressive so other things here beyond the powers honda revealed a, a few other improvements here they have done to it so it gets a bigger radiator grill and a fan all to help with cooling so if you remember the previous generation when that launched it was having some cooling issues on track they improved that already with the revisions for the uh, mid-cycle refresh for the Type R. But right out of the gate here, they're making sure cooling is a priority for this new one so that it will not have the issues the previous generation had. On top of that, the manual transmission gets a new high rigidity lever, a lighter flywheel, and an optimized shift gate pattern for hyper-precise gear changes, they're saying. Um, it also still has auto rev matching for the downshifts, and the previous generation's dual axis strut front suspension and multi-link rear suspension both seem to carry over, but of course we'll be getting a retune in a completely new platform and chassis so um, even though those components are similar to the old vehicle again it's in a totally new car and so of course needed new tuning and you know should help to you know make it even better um, you know just having those good parts in a better body and they say these retunes also provide better straight line stability and steering feel another thing that was added to help stability is a reverse rim design for the wheels that improved the st stability of the tire contact patch when under load um, which is an interesting thing I'd never thought about and just a very creative outside of the box way of you know improving things ever so slightly and so that's cool also those tires are now wider um, you know they're 20 millimeters wider so that gives you extra stability and handling as well they're 265s all around uh, the brakes also seem to be carryover but do get better cooling and a retuned brake booster for better feel and controllability and uh, that's all the info we have for now they've also shown us some new pictures of it here so we get to now see it in every single color it'll be offered in it looks really good though this is one of the few vehicles that I think I basically like the way it looks in every single color 
But let me know in the comments below which color you would pick. I'm having a tough time deciding between either, you know, the blue, the boost blue is a really fun color, the red, honestly, even the sonic gray is really cool, or, you know, the championship white, that vintage-y white is also something that pulls at my heartstrings being, you know, a vintage lover. So, uh, yeah, awesome. They have so many great colors here for it, and uh, so good to finally at least get some specs here for the Type R, and, uh, you know, we'll have more info here this fall. In some other hot hatch news here, Volkswagen has revealed the details for the 2023 Golf R 20th Anniversary Edition um, that's coming here to the States. So, on the outside, it actually deletes the sunroof, which is a little bit surprising. They say that's for, you know, a lower center of gravity and lighter weight, but it seems you know, like an odd thing to do. But anyway, got rid of the sunroof. It swaps out the silver R badges for blue ones, along with adding uh, 20 badges there on the B pillars and uh, puddle lights. And the wheels are now painted black. On the inside, it gets blue R badges again. Plus, there's real carbon fiber trim on the dashboard and doors, which Volkswagen says is the first time this has ever been done on a production Volkswagen which I have a hard time believing, but I guess, you know, they would know that's their, their company, but it's just crazy to think there's been never another, you know, Volkswagen branded product that had real carbon fiber on the inside. So anyway, uh, there's going to be 1,800 of these built and they'll be available in either blue, white, or black, as well as being available for both the manual and the automatic. It'll cost $46,035, including destination for the manual and $800 more for the automatic. And they'll be uh, starting to arrive at dealers this fall. Subaru of Japan has started teasing the 2023 Crosstrek, um, which is going to be debuting here on September 15th. Uh, so the teaser video gives us a quick and unclear look at the vehicle uh, from multiple different angles and settings. But thankfully, we only have two weeks or so here to wait for the full reveal. But, um, you know, it's a cool teaser here. And uh, from what we can see so far, it looks pretty good. But sadly, there is no hood scoop in any of these teaser images. So unfortunately, it sounds like we're going to have to keep on waiting and dreaming for a WX powered Crosstrek, which seems like an easy money printer. Uh, and a great way to you know expand the WX line because essentially it would just be a WX hatch at this point considering the WX now has more ground clearance and all the body cladding from the cross track anyway you know you'd think they might as well just raise it up another inch or so and give it the hatch and then would have sold way more of them considering how well the cross track sells but Unfortunately, it seems like there is no WX Power One, or if there is, it's not going to have a hood scoop. But I'm guessing, you know, at least for now, they'll roll out just carryover engines. Maybe we will get a you know turbo one in the future. We'll have to see. Um, but one new addition we can expect is a wilderness version. You know, they did it for the Forester and the Outback. I just reviewed the Forester one this week. Um, and obviously it makes total sense to do it for the cross truck as well. And the spy shots have shown some beefed up roof racks and stuff like that. So expect there to be a wilderness version of this for sure, even at launch. Um, and uh, so... Anyway, uh, yeah, it'll probably get more cladding and stuff if that's even possible as well. But uh, we'll have to see, you know, what all gets revealed here in about two weeks. But very interesting and exciting to see that. I honestly wasn't expecting the new cross truck to come this soon, but happy to see it. So cool to see that. Ford has once again teased the 2024 Mustang this week ahead of its reveal here in about two weeks at the Detroit Auto Show. So, and this time we get a uh, Twitter video that uh, shows uh, some revs here and lots of wheel spin from a V8 powered Mustang is what we can hear. You know, you don't get to see anything, but, um, you know, this confirms one, the V8 is sticking around, which we had no doubt there to confirm that. The manual is sticking around there to confirm that as well. And this teaser confirms it will continue to be rear wheel drive. Um, there was, you know, talks that there would maybe be an all wheel drive option that still could be on the table and could be coming at launch or later on down the road. But clearly, the vehicle in this teaser is 100% rear wheel drive because there's lots of wheel spin uh, you can hear there whenever they launch it. And so, um, Yes, uh, interesting to get that little teaser and uh, just another fun one there. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the full reveal here in a couple of weeks. And some other Mustang news here. You may remember a while back, there was a GT350 mule running around that was spied with a weird raised hood that had a hood bulge that was so high, I don't know how the driver even saw where he was going with it. Um, and so anyway, that's kicked off a bunch of exciting rumors about, oh boy, they're gonna do some kind of crazy Mustang. And so uh, this week, YouTuber Revan Evan, I was lucky enough to have four performance show him uh, what they've been working on here with that uh, test mule there. So it was in fact running the 7.3 liter Godzilla V8 like some people suspected, but sadly it was only to test it as a crate engine. So, um, it's already available as a crate engine with a 10-speed automatic, by the way, which I didn't even realize because I don't pay attention really to the aftermarket side of, you know, for performance here. But it was already available as a crate engine. Uh, but this test mule was just to test it with a manual transmission. They said they just had a GT350 laying around in the back of the lot there that hadn't been used much. And so they decided to, you know, hack it up and uh, throw this motor in there. It was obviously just a prototype that was probably going to be crushed anyway. So it's not like it was a loss of a GT350 really. But um, they, you know, used it to uh, test out this new uh, crate engine setup. And they are testing 
testing it with a manual transmission now. That's what the new testing is for. Since they already have it with the automatic, this was to test it with the manual. Um, and so uh, the hood bulge uh, was needed because the, supposedly the throttle body on the engine typically points upward on the Super Duties that run this motor. And for early testing, they hadn't changed that yet. Now for the crate engine, they have changed it so that it does fit into an actual Mustang without needing an enormous hood on it with like a, a you know a throttle body that's level with the engine itself. Um, so, but just in the early stages, this is what they had to do just to test it out. And, um, so anyway, if you're interested in swapping one of these into your Mustang, uh, the crate will be very competitively priced and will be uh, arriving uh, by the end of this year. Uh, but that competitively priced might be a relative term depending on what you're expecting because the 7.3 liter with the automatic currently is uh, $20,000 um, know, to buy that from Ford. So uh, expect it to be something around there, maybe a little bit less for a manual we'll to see. But uh, anyway, it's still cool to have that mystery solved because a lot of times we see weird prototypes and we always are like, well, I don't know what that was and we never find out or we just assume something but you know getting an actual answer and seeing the vehicle is very cool so awesome to see that and after just rolling out the first of seven special editions here last week for uh, the last call versions of the Charger and Challenger for 2023 here from Dodge, Dodge has now rolled out the second one this week, so they're rolling them out quick here. So it's the 2023 Dodge Charger Super B, and they say it's the highest performing Charger Super B they've ever made. Uh, it's not messing around either. It's got drag radials on it, um, so don't drive this thing unless it is totally dry outside. Uh, it also has a drag mode for the adaptive dampers, an SRT hood with with hood pins, functional scoop, heat extractors, it has black exhaust tips along with badges and graphics. And Dodge didn't actually specifically say which motor this thing is running, um, but it's assumed like it's a, the other Super Bs in the past where it runs the 392. And so anyway, a thousand of these will be built. Uh, 500 will be in B5 blue with the narrow body and 500 will be in plum crazy purple with the wide body. Um, and there's no pricing for those yet. I'm curious how well all these things are gonna sell because again, seven special editions here. Um, they're making, you know, at least a thousand of each of them, it seems. And uh, I just, I wonder if the market is truly there for this many special editions and this high of production for all of them. But anyway, uh, that's what they're doing. It's interesting to see that. And it look cool, you know, like they always do. Um, another name that's making a comeback here is the rally art name for Mitsubishi. But who this one almost deserved a drink, but it's just, it's Mitsubishi. So it's kind of to be expected. So it's not really much of a shock, uh, but they've been teasing the return of Rally Art for a while, uh, but sadly it is of course disappointing. So they announced this week that the name will return in early 2023 for special edition versions of the entire lineup. Outlander, Outlander Plug-in Hybrid, Eclipse Cross, Outlander Sport, and even the Mirage. It's a rally art version. So you can see what's coming here. So they say they'll all get unique body effects, graphics, and other rally inspired touches. And if the Japanese pictures are any indication, that means it'll get like mud flaps that are red. They'll also be uh, white with black roofs and will be built in limited numbers. Um, I'm not sure why they're bothering with even saying that because I mean, I'm sure they're not gonna be selling out of these things or anything, but um, sadly, Again, none of this is really a surprise, but it's just disappointing. Like they have an opportunity, you know, they could do like RAV4 Prime or something and make the, a faster version of the Outlander plug-in hybrid, give it the Rally Art badge, that have that be like the Prime badge for higher performance or something. Have it mean something than just, a, you know, a sticker special. Um, and so anyway, that's uh, what they're doing here. So soon you'll be able to get a Mirage Rally Art with a whopping like 85 horsepower, whatever those have. Um, <laughs> and uh Oh man, Mitsubishi just feels like they're circling the drain here in the States. I, I mean, the Outlander seems to be really, really impressive. I haven't driven one, but everything else is like, oh man, like they could do more and they do more in other markets. And then just here in the States, it's just, yeah. Anyway, um, it's not a big loss here, but uh, another little Mitsubishi news thing is that another manual transmission is also going away. So the Mirage was offered with a manual and that's part of how it got its super low starting price. Um, but for 2023, the Mirage is losing the manual option. Now only available with a CVT, um, which is also a little bit of a shame because the Mirage is like the closest thing you can get to like an 80s Econobox car still. Um, and those were almost always better with the manual than they were with the automatic. So um, anyway, but yeah, but as a result now the Mirage uh, base price increases by $1,600 for a vehicle that starts used to start at $14,645. That's a huge price jump. Um, and obviously, I mean, most people probably still got the automatics anyway, but you know, just a little bit of a bummer that now it's not going to be able to brag about that low price tag. Instead, it's going to be, you know, over $16,000 now for a, a base Mirage. Um, 
And then the last a notable change to Mitsubishi's lineup here is that the Outlander and the Eclipse Cross both are dropping their front-wheel drive versions and get all-wheel drive as standard now, um, which also drives up their base prices. So another, um, you know, thing just going up in price and, uh, you know, another way they can't differentiate themselves from other players in the market. You know, if they force all-wheel drive on everyone, that's fine, but what about the people that don't need all-wheel drive, you know, that now can't buy a Mitsubishi because they don't want to overpay for an all-wheel drive model? It just, I don't know, it seems like not the greatest move, you know, for Mitsubishi if they're trying to survive, you know, broaden the appeal, don't limit it. Uh, but anyway, um, that's the little updates here for Mitsubishi for 2023. And some other potentially disappointing news, uh, depending on how you feel about it, that is, uh, there's a rumor that McLaren may make an SUV, um, which had long been shot down by McLaren in the past, but now they're reconsidering it, and it could also be electric. So, um, yeah, again, it really depends on how you feel about electric SUVs from supercar companies. But as recently as 2019, McLaren's chief designer was quoted as saying, we really do deliver on the ultimate driving experience. For us, it means no compromise. An SUV isn't a no compromise kind of vehicle. So flat out, like an SUV would be a compromise for us and we're not going to do it. And uh, now McLaren has a new chief technical officer. Um, he formerly worked at Porsche and Ferrari, where you guessed it, he's one of the ones who pushed through the Cayenne and the Macan and the Pro Songway even for Ferrari. Um, so he said uh, in an interview that uh, with Autocar here just recently that the SUV segment continues to grow and that it's a very attractive market segment. Um, so, I mean, I guess it's on McLaren for hiring the guy, and I guess you know, that was part of the deal is, hey, we're going to do an SUV most likely. So um, he added, though, that a McLaren SUV would be in line with our DNA, which, based on their designer's quotes at least, would mean no compromises. Um, obviously, there's that's a marketing thing. You could say, oh, this SUV has no compromises, and maybe it won't. I don't know. But, um, you know, it just seems like a little bit of a contradiction from their past stance. So we'll see what happens. There's no details here, but Autocar is predicting it would likely be electric and cost over $400,000 and primarily would be competing with the Urus, uh, Pura Songway, and the DBX 707. So, you know, I mean, if it's the first electric one to the punch, you know, with everyone else still running gas, that could give it a little bit of an edge, but I feel like everyone buying these, you know, uh, SUVs from these supercar companies probably don't want electric. Otherwise, they would just went out and bought a Tesla Model X that does, you know, a two and a half seconds zero to 60 already or whatever, but... I don't know, you know, maybe, maybe there's, you know, a niche there that McLaren can uh, fill and we'll have to see, but uh, very interesting to hear that. And for the last news story here, Automotive News is reporting that Nissan dealers recently got a memo saying that the Rogue Sport will end production this December, December of 2022, and that it won't get a new generation, which I was really surprised to hear this. Subcompact crossovers are really hot right now. Um, and without the Rogue Sport, Nissan has nothing with all-wheel drive in the subcompact segment. They still have the Kicks, which is smaller, one of the cheapest uh, things in that segment, at least from a price standpoint, you know, and uh, front-wheel drive, you know, it's one of the lowest horsepower ones in that segment as well. Um, you yeah, know, the Rogue Sport was kind of a nice step up from the Kicks, and now that's not going to be there. So it's either going to be you get a tiny little Kicks or you get the Rogue, which is, you know, big, much more expensive, and all that. So... I don't know. I mean, for SUVs, at least here in the States, having, you know, all-wheel drive is very, very important, even in the subcompact segment. So, uh, yeah, so that apparently that's the plan, though. And um, Nissan's vice president claims in the memo, though, that um, with the all-new Rogue and the recently redesigned Kicks, we will continue to cover this part of the market effectively. Eh. And that uh, we also will be able to invest more resources in our current vehicles and next-generation products. So it's a cost-cutting thing as well. That makes sense. Nissan's trying to, you know, get back to a, a stronger position, you know, so I can certainly see that. It's just, you know, you would think, I mean, not, just to play devil's advocate here, you would think they would be cutting the sports cars and stuff like that before they'd be cutting the Rogue Sport. Because I'm sure even though the Rogue Sport doesn't sell great, I'm sure it sells more than the Z, um, you know, and things like that that are, you know, very resource intensive. Obviously, those are Halo products. They're important to the brand. I don't want to see them kill those things off. But just from a business standpoint and a sales standpoint, it's surprising they're getting rid of it. I'm not sad about it, by the way. It's just kind of surprising to me. Um, but thankfully, Automotive News does make more sense of this here. So in their report here, their anonymous dealer sources are claiming that a next generation Kicks um, is arriving in 2024 and that it'll be bigger, more SUV-like, and be offered with all-wheel drive. So problem solved. So, you know, all those questions, you know, are then put to rest if that does in fact turn out to be true. 
But if that's not coming until 2024 calendar year, then that means we got all of 2023 still with Nissan not having anything to offer. Obviously, they'll still have some Rogue Sports supply, I'm sure, you know, well into 2023. And maybe they're hoping that carries them through, even though there's going to be a gap in model years there. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just going to be interesting. They're not going to really have something there for a little while. And uh, But, I mean, consolidating two vehicles into one and making the kicks just, you know, the one good subcompact that offers everything in the segment, uh, you know, certainly makes sense. And I can see, you know, why they're doing this, you know, in that context. Again, if that report turns out to be true. Um uh, but it's still, it's just, you know, I feel like they would have just kept building it right up until the very end. And even like some companies build the old one alongside the new one for a little while, you know, just to maximize profit. But I mean, you know, even Fiat, they still sell a 500X and surely, surely Nissan sells more Rogue Sports than Fiat sells 500Xs. I could be wrong, but you know, I just, I just, it's just, you know, impressive that Nissan's killing it off, you know, this soon. Um, but uh, again, I'm not sad about it. I reviewed it back five years ago in 2017. Even in 2017, it wasn't super competitive in its segment. I think there was basically everything else I preferred over the Rogue Sport in many different ways, even back then. And then these days, there's been even, you know, a lot better competitors. So, I mean, it's really lagging for sure. But, you know, still could be a great, you know, option for someone if there's, you know, a big discount on it or something. Um, and so anyway... It's, again, a vehicle nobody will miss. Sorry, Nissan, but no one's going to miss the Rogue Sport here in the States. In Europe, it sells great, supposedly, as the cash guy. But here in the States, no one seems to really care about them too much. So totally understandable. And hopefully the new kicks will, again, be the uh, great little subcompact crossover that Nissan needs. So interesting to hear that. And lastly, I want to thank all of you who are members of the Matt Moran Motoring Club. So we did have one new member join this week. So I want to give a huge thank you to Kylan Walters for becoming a member this week. Hopefully you're enjoying the perks so far. And I really, really appreciate the support and uh, really thank you for becoming a member. Um, and so uh, anyone else you know, who's a member here, be sure to stay tuned for uh, the live stream coming this month. Uh, it's going to probably either be uh, in the middle of the month or at the very end of the month there on the weekend. I'm still trying to figure it out. But uh, of course you will be getting priority replies if you're a member uh, in the live stream here uh, like you always do uh, and for anyone else that's interested in joining there's a link in the description as well as a uh, join buttons here on the uh, video page and on the channel page um, if you're interested in joining and also if you're interested in uh, signing up for one of those petrol boxes there's also a link in the description for that as well but anyway that's it as far as all the news this week guys so let me know your thoughts and all this stuff in the comments below thank you all very much for watching and i'll see you on the next one take care